Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, Hi, I'm Elena. Uh, I'm an engineering manager on Google Play. I lead app distribution and developer console platform teams. I'm here to talk to you about how you can launch smart on Google Play. So Ellie did a great overview of how you can develop smart and do, do well while you're developing. I'm here to also tell you a little bit about what you do when you come to, 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 to launching on, on Google Play. More specifically, I want to talk about rapid iteration and how you can iterate your app to higher quality and to a better market fit using some of the tools that we provide in Google Play Developer Console. Uh, I'm also going to talk about how you can analyze your app, how you can experiment with various things, both about your app and about your store, uh, store listing, how you can optimize a number of different things, how you can localize, go globally, and in general, just kind of improve performance uh, of your app on the Google Play Store. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about how you can really listen and hear what users are telling you about your app, and then how you can interact with them uh, by, by, by addressing their feedback. Uh, and then we're very briefly going to touch on, uh, on how you can monitor, how you can do all this on the go, and especially how you can monitor the state of your app on the go. So let's start with launching and iterating. Um, I wanted to start with this quote we got from Michael Ritter, uh, the SVP of Business Development at SGN. Uh, so they shared this feedback with us why they launched Genies and Gems on Android first. Um, basically, they told us that uh, because they can iterate uh, very fast on Google Play, because the publishing delays are so low, so, uh, are very low, and uh, publishing is very quick, um, they were they were able to kind of uh, achieve very significant business outcomes. Uh, there is more of a quote: uh, SGNs are very uh, heavy users of beta testing, of store listing experiments, a number of different uh, iteration tools and experimentation tools that I'll, I'll keep uh, uh, referring to in this talk. Uh, but uh, kind of the interesting thing was also that they took a number of findings from uh, kind of their, their their insights from experimenting using our tools, and then were also able to apply them to uh, other platforms, which is a very efficient way of doing business. Okay, so as I, as I go through this talk, I will be referring to various different stages of launching. And I suspect many of you have done this before. You, you have went through these steps. Um, the first one would be beta testing. So that's when you have kind of the core flow of your app, the core uh, idea uh, of what you want to do, but you're still not ready to go very widely with it. You want to you know, try it out with a few friends, family, maybe employees at your company, you know, kind of some sort of narrow, narrow audience. The second step would be soft launching. So this is when you actually want to expose, you, wanna, you want users to, to, to you know, get their hands on your app, they want them to try a few things, um, you want them to actually try to use it so you can measure some KPIs, like are users returning to your, your app? How, is, how are daily active users? How, how does retention look? How are kind of these basic KPIs looking uh, uh, about your app? Uh, at some point, you will, you know, kind of when the, all of those numbers look really good, when users are, you know, spending money or spending time within your app, you will want to launch. So kind of we will also talk about what are the tools that are helpful at that point. And then we'll also talk about what happens after that. After the initial launch, you still want to keep going at the app. You want to keep adding new features. You want to keep kind of making it better. And that basically kicks off this whole cycle again of kind of when you're considering new features that you want to beta test, that you want to soft launch, and eventually uh, uh, launch and so on. OK, I'll, I'll start with beta testing first. Um, more than 60% of the top 1,000 apps on Google Play are running a beta test right now. This has been a very, very popular tool. We have heard really great feedback from, from developers about it. Um, I, uh, there is, you can run, as I mentioned, closed beta test with a very limited, a limited audience. Uh, you can run open beta test with a much wider audience where you can get much more feedback. I will not go into details about how each one of these work, what are the you know, kind of different, different things about it, what are the things that are, that are the same. Um, I'm, uh, I will be doing office hours later here today, and I'll be, uh, I'll be here throughout the day. So if you have any questions about that, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, however, one thing that I do want to talk about is some of the improvements we've made to, to the beta testing in the last couple of months. Um, one of those was at I.O. this year, we've uh, allowed users to start opting in to apps with open betas from the Play Store itself. So users can now discover apps with open beta programs, and they can opt in directly from, from the Play Store. Uh, this has proved to be, you know, that very step that kind of uh, removes the, 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 the churn and of, of users joining, joining your beta test. So uh, many apps have told us that they've got 10x larger beta programs as a consequence of, of uh, uh, making this change. So it's kind of, uh, it 
beta testing in that sense becomes a very powerful soft launch tool where you can actually get a meaningful number of users using your app while, while it's still kind of in development. Uh, and you can actually get relevant KPIs. You can work on optimizing those KPIs and really kind of making them better. So at the point when you, when you launch fully, you're kind of really ready. Uh, which is exactly what we recommend. We recommend if you haven't tried this, we recommend you try running an open beta and getting users' feedback and kind of really, really iterating and, and uh, working on it. It does help you get to a higher quality build. It helps you get better product market fit, and it helps you fine tune your, your, fine -tune your KPIs, uh, kind of all of the metrics that you care about, about your app or your game. Um, one more thing that we launched recently is private feedback from your beta testers. Again, beta testers can submit feedback directly from the Play Store front. However, don't worry, no one else gets to see this. It's just for you. You can see it in Developer Console. And this, these reviews don't affect your average rating. So it's a very safe environment for you to try out different things. It's OK if not everything works. It's better that you find out about that during the beta test than once you're launched to everyone in production. And another recent addition to the beta testing program is early access. So this is a new collection which we are now showing to, to, to users in the Play Storefront, which features interesting apps and games that are still in development, but that are uh, running an open beta test. Um, users can find them, discover them there, and then again, this is kind of another way that's bringing people who are interested, especially those users who are early adopters, who, who do want to try new things, who do want to, um, you know, kind of yeah, be, be the first ones to discover an app and to use it. Uh, they're the ones, you know, kind of who, 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 who you can, whose feedback you can basically get by being part of the early access program. Um, if you do have an app coming out soon, please do reach out to us and, you know, mention that you would like to be part of the early access program. We are actively onboarding uh, apps uh, to it. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, I will not go into details, but uh, the, the developers that have uh, been part of the early access program so far have, have, have shared really, really good feedback with us. They've told us that it really helps them, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, improve the quality again, kind of iterate, uh, try out a lot of things in a very, in a very uh, nice and quick way. Um, and just kind of a couple of notes. Um, uh, my favorite feedback was from ReadFeed, which is an online book club, which was uh, a, a part of the first batch of apps that were part of uh, the Early Access program. So they've told us that um, being part of Early Access helped them identify new markets. So kind of what are the different things their app could be doing to, to, to kind of really be useful for more users. Uh, they've told us that, that they were able to identify a number of different bugs, a number of different feature requests that users really want. Uh, in addition to that, they were able to A-B test various different things within their app to, before they launched uh, openly to everyone. And then finally, they were also able to build a community of very passionate users. These early adopters are users who you, you know, they are the promoters for your app. They are the community that can really kind of create a lot of buzz about your app. So this is why this is another benefit you can get from this. Um, and if all this wasn't enough to convince you that soft launching is a really good thing to try out, um, there are a few more things. Um, sometimes we hear feedback from developers who say that, you know, they would rather keep it kind of close and tight and then just do kind of a, a, big, bag, a big bang launch. Um, keep in mind that you only get one chance to make first impression with your users. Uh, obviously, you want to make the, you know, kind of the right first impression. Um, and the other thing is, if you, if you try out your app just with, you know, 10 or, 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 or 50 users before you actually launch it, you risk, you know, kind of those users being your friends, maybe not being honest or uh, kind of not, not telling you, like, a lot of uh, data-driven stuff of, like, how often they use your app, how often, you know, kind of they're returning to it and all that. So definitely consider something that's a little bit more scaled uh, before you actually launch openly to everyone. Okay, a couple of tips um, on how to soft launch. Um, closed beta would be the first thing to do. You want to um, kind of, yeah, a uh, smaller limited set of people. Uh, you want to test out the, the proof of concept, uh, the core game mechanics of, uh, or, or, or the core app flows um, that are kind of important to you. Basic user experience, obviously want to catch the, 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 the crudest of uh, crashes and you want to get some open-ended uh, feedback from your users. 
as a second stage, consider a soft launch that's still kind of a bit limited. You can, you can do this limiting by either choosing a, a subset of countries, perhaps the ones that are, you know, that have fewer users. We hear very often that the developers uh, do soft launch in New Zealand, which is kind of a good approximation for big markets like US or, or, or uh, Europe, uh, but it's still kind of smaller in the, in, the, in the size. Or you can limit based on the number of devices or languages or kind of any, any, any different ways. At that point, you can already start to track the metrics that you get. So at, at this point, you can already start looking at the actual data coming in, and rather than you know, trusting people to write you a couple of lines of how they like your app, you can actually see, it. are they using it twice a day? Are they using it for an hour a day? That's kind of, uh, those are very useful signals. And then as a final stage, just before you launch, you want to consider going open beta to all the actual markets where you're looking to, 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 to launch externally. Um, at this point, you should be able to get sufficient data to really kind of uh, make sure that you know, kind of your game, eco game economy is working or that you know, kind of users are using your app in a way that you would like them to use. Um, okay, so let's slot in these two things that we talked about into our app lifecycle or our launch lifecycle. So beta testing and early, early access, it's important to keep in mind that they are useful all throughout of your lifecycle. You want to use them to soft launch, you want to use them as you're launching for the first time kind of uh, to, to, to everyone, and then you want to keep using them after that to keep iterating on all the you know, kind of new features that you're building um, and to, to, to keep improving your app. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how you can improve the quality of your app early on. Uh, Ellie has talked about Firebase Test Lab, so I'm gonna keep building on top of this. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the pre-launch report. Uh, pre-launch report is uh, powered by Firebase Test Lab, so all of the APKs that get uploaded to alpha and beta channel in developer console uh, automatically get sent to, to Firebase Test Lab, and we run a number of monkey tests uh, on them. We try of kind of uh, uh, testing out various different things. Um, and then kind of based on that, we generate a report which is shared with you within an hour of you uploading those APKs to Google Play Developer Console. The first thing that you want to check out in the report are crashes. Uh, we will run the tests on, you know, kind of couple of tens of devices. This is generally more than you can, this is probably more than you can um, do yourself while you're kind of de developing all the time. So it's quite useful. It's, you know, automatic. It's free. So it just kind of uh, comes in uh, as, a, as a very nice, cheap way to detect these crashes early. In particular, you know, you do want to catch these crashes before they turn into one-star reviews and, you know, kind of uh, uh, everyone sees, uh, knows about them. For Every crash report, you will be able to see a stack trace, you will be able to see device metadata, and then some kind of other metadata about the run and, 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 and so on. Uh, the other thing that's part of the pre-launch report are screenshots. Uh, so this, uh, as we, as we do these monkey tests on your APKs, we um, take screenshots of kind of all, all along the way, and then we share these screenshots with you in Google Play Developer Console. Uh, this comes in pretty handy to see how your app looks on uh, various different device screen sizes or DPIs or kind of anything like that. Um, it also comes in pretty handy, uh, as you can see in the highlighted screenshot, for testing out. We try uh, testing out with a couple of different languages. And um, uh, the, for example, in, in this screenshot, you can see that the German translations are, are too long and they make the UI kind of overflow a little bit. So, you know, again, you want to catch this uh, uh, before the app is actually launched. And then finally, um, we also share security alerts about the APKs that you just uploaded. Obviously, I know no one here would, you know, kind of upload security vulnerability on purpose, uh, but it does happen sometimes by, by mistake. It also does happen if you pull in um, a third-party uh, SDK, for example, ads or analytics library. These sometimes, you know, kind of uh, come in with security vulner vulnerabilities. So again, you, you, you want to find out about this sooner rather than later. And a, a quote we got from Flink, who, who were really happy with the pre-launch report so far. Uh, it, uh, they were saying that it helps them test on way more devices than they could afford if they were to do it manually. Okay, and let's slot pre-launch report. Again, just like beta testing and early access, it's sort of useful all throughout your, your launch lifecycle. You want to try it early on. It's never... You know, it's never too early to, to start getting this feedback. You want to use it as you're launching, and you want to use it once your app is uh, live. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about analyzing, experimenting, and, and optimizing. Uh, the first tool that I want to talk about is user acquisition report. Um, uh, 
the user acquisition report is a conversion funnel that shows you how many visitors to your store listing you're getting, how many of those are turning into installers, and then how many of those are actually buying something within your app and eventually becoming uh, uh, repeat buyers. You can also break down this report based on the acquisition source, so whether this is organic traffic that came kind of uh, through the Play Store, or whether, whether this is paid traffic that came through, through ads or, 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 or something like that. Um, as of very recently, you can also break down this report by country, so you can see how your convert, whether, for example, your localizations are not great and you're not converting that well in you know, kind of Asia compared to Europe and so on. And once you, yeah, once you, once you um, have this data, obviously you'll want to optimize. You know, kind of just, just having the data for, for, for its own sake is not very useful. Um, the tool that kind of fits in really well with user acquisition report and that will help you optimize this kind of very top of the funnel, this kind of drop off between number of visitors and installers, are store listing experiments. Um, this has been another tool that has been very, very successful so far. Developers have told, it, uh, told us that they really like it, um, precisely because as when you optimize the top of your funnel, you make the whole funnel wider, and basically it, it, it's, it's more likely that you know, kind of more users will eventually also turn to buyers and to repeat buyers and, and, and so on. Um, more than 70% of our top developers use store listing experiment. It's, it's, it's a great number, uh, and you know, kind of it's, uh, I don't think it's surprising given that it's, uh, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's bringing results. Uh, it's, bringing, it's bringing you better conversion rates, and it's bringing you more installers, and that's kind of uh, precisely what you want. Uh, the other thing is obviously the tool is you know free. The only thing that you need is a designer or a copywriter, so someone you know kind of who can actually work with trying to optimize your store listing and trying to to, to kind of convert uh, more users for you. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of examples of uh, examples about store listing experiments. Uh, I feel that's the best way to show you how developers are actually using it to give you ideas of you know kind of what's 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 useful to to try out and to test. Uh, here that I want to, to that I wanted to, to, to start with uh, here are um, Flare Games who have um, run with a single icon test for their um, uh, Royal Revolt 2. Uh, they have managed to increase um, user acquisition rate by 30 percent. So this was pretty good, like run one test, you know, kind of, and, and be able to, to to increase number of uh, installers by that much. Um, eRepublic Lab is kind of a little bit on the on the other side for their uh, for launch of uh, Age of Lords. They have run uh, a string of different experiments, and they have ranged from plus five percent to plus twenty nine percent until have really kind of uh, uh, overall improvements to their acquisition rate were, were also pretty high. Uh, that was really good. Um, Expedia is another interesting example. Uh, they, you know, you would think Expedia is a well-established brand at this point, and that you kind of uh, experimenting with their uh, assets wouldn't be worth it. That turned out not to be the case. They have managed to get uh, their in, uh, global install rate uh, up by 10% by optimizing uh, uh, their assets. So um, it's worth thinking that if Expedia is a well-established brand can do this, then apps that are very early in their life cycle can do even better. You can, if you can go with the bolder changes, you can try even more things and uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, get even better results. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, Spry Fox's Alpha Bear. Um, as you can see, they have a very unique uh, visual style, kind of very, very interesting, creative, uh, you know, kind of vision for what they wanted uh, to do. And yet, they were able to kind of experiment with different uh, uh, icon types. Uh, icon is particularly big for games. Kind of experimenting with with different icon types for games is a really big thing. Uh, they started with the one on the uh, f uh, far left, <clears throat> and it turned out that the one on the far right is actually converting converting 18% better. So you know it's it's kind of wor worth uh, yeah experimenting with 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 a few of these different ones. Um, Instacart had a really great success with uh, experimenting with their uh, short description. So uh, uh, just by changing their short description, they managed to increase um, uh, their um, conversion rate by 14%. Um, and what we generally found to work really well is uh, short and to the point short descriptions, which explain the value of your the, the, the value proposition of your app in the, the shortest kind of possible way. This is, this is what we've seen kind of work. Uh, uh, very well consistently. And Angry Birds went to town with it. They kind of really uh, went on the, on the store listing uh, experiments bandwagon, and they were testing for, for Angry Birds pop launch. They were testing the uh, icon over and over and over again. It keeps going. Basically, they were running test after test after test. Um, and um, 
with each one, they were choosing a winner and then trying out even more kind of variants. I guess their designers were having a lot of fun with this uh, until they, they ended up with the one that was kind of in, in double, digit, uh, double digit increase comparing to uh, uh, where they started. So you know, just kind of it's, it's, it's worth not just testing once, it's worth keeping the iterations going and just really keeping, the, uh, keeping this moving because you can, there, there seems to, to always be some gains to be had in, uh, in this area. And the final one, I promise, this is the last example. <laughs> uh, this is Mixi. Uh, this one is interesting because uh, Mixi is a, 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 like a, ve a very big Japanese developer, but they were looking to, to go into US. They wanted to, to, to bring their Monster Strike game into, into US. Um, however, they, they, they had a feeling that the local taste of people in the US would be different to the local taste of people in Japan. So they wanted to make sure that they really match uh, the, that local ta uh, taste is expressed in the, in the store listing. So they started iterating on the, on the feature graphic and on the video, then went on to, to, to iterate on the screenshots, on the description, and, and uh, eventually on the icon. Um, over the, the, the scope of a couple of months, they have managed to increase their conversion rate by 68% by running kind of test after test in a very scientific, very methodical way, very persistent way. So it's just kind of, it's two main takeaways from this would be a, you know, kind of keep, keep going at it, keep kind of m making changes and keep testing. And the, the other one would be, yes, users in different countries have very different tastes, uh, to taste, a very different kind of local flavor. So, uh, you know, kind of your store listing in Asia will probably end up looking much different to you or should end up looking much different to your store listing in, in, in Europe. Okay, a couple of best practices. Uh, testing multiple languages, this is exactly what I, what I was uh, um, uh, telling just now. So it's uh, yeah, kind of worth uh, trying out different things uh, for, for, for different languages. And as of earlier this year, you can run multiple tests in parallel in different languages. So this, this can now be very easy and, and efficient. Uh, iterate, you know, keep at it. Keep, you know, kind of it looks like there is always kind of a next improvement to be had. Um, focus on one thing at a time. So it's kind of if you don't do icon and description test at the same time because it's going to be hard to know what actually worked. So choose to optimize the icon first and then optimize the screenshots or, or, or so on. Uh, try to come up with some sort of hypothesis. This is another thing that we've heard is kind of, do you feel like your icon is too busy or do you feel your colors are too pale or just kind of, if you can try to come up with some sort of hypothesis, then you can, you know, kind of possibly optimize in a more, in a better way than just randomly trying out different text or graphics. Um, give it some time. It takes time to reach statistical significance with, with these results. Don't, you know, kind of, we, we, we try to, we, we pay a lot of attention uh, to, to tell you when we think the, 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 the experiment is done and ready. Uh, but in general, just giving it more time is going to be, you know, kind of more, you, you will be more sure that it's going to yield actual good results. Uh, and finally, be bold. Yeah, especially if you're early in your startup's life, uh, you know, try out a lot of different things. It's kind of, it's harmless and it's cheap, so it's worth playing around with a lot of different uh, visual identities. Okay, and the last thing related to localizing. Um, earlier this year, we've also launched pricing templates. Pricing templates allow you to um, manage the pricing for your entire app and in a product catalog um, in a kind of in a bulk way, in a very easy bulk way. Uh, so if you haven't switched to them yet, many developers have, but if you haven't switched to them yet, we definitely recommend them as a very efficient bulk pricing management tool. However, on top of that, um, when we added pricing templates, we've also added smart localized price rounding. So for example, if you input your default price and auto convert to, to all the um, uh, 70 markets to which Google Play now sells using the latest uh, conversion rates, we will do the smart rounding. So for example, uh, you don't end up with 0 0.73 euros price, you end up with 0 0.99, or you don't end up with uh, 182 Japanese yen, we, we would round that to 200 Japanese yen. Um, so these kind of, we came up with these smart, locally relevant pricing uh, rounding rules. Uh, so yeah, just kind of uh, make sure you refresh your prices to, 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 to pick those up. Uh, your, uh, your store listing in your catalog will look more professional to users in those countries, and it will also look more relevant for their local um, uh, culture. Okay. Let <clears throat> Uh, uh, let's slot a couple of these tools in, in our life cycle as well. Um, user acquisition tool, uh, sorry, user acquisition reports, service experiments and pricing templates, all only valid once you fully launch. These are the tools that require you to have 
a lot of data or like certain amount of data uh, before you can kind of work with them. So um, you can only use them once you launch and once you keep iterating on your app once, uh, once it's fully launched. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about listening to what you, your users are really telling you and about uh, interacting with, uh, with your users. Uh, we've touched very briefly on the private feedback in the, in the first section on uh, beta testing, but let's say now you're launched, you're out to, kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to everyone, and uh, there is a lot of feedback coming in. What do you do with all those feedback? Um, but be before that, let me just refer to kind of um, two things that may not be entirely obvious. As you work, on your app quality, especially this quality is ref reflected through your average rating score, um, you will actually also be increasing your revenue. This may not be entirely obvious, but the, the feedback we've heard from a number of developers, and the recent one is from uh, Gameville, is that by bringing their app from 3.3 stars to 4.1 stars, they've also increased their revenue by 160%. I mean, this is pretty good stuff, right? So it's, it's, it's worth trying out. Uh, the other thing that totally may not be obvious, uh, is that by working on your quality through improving the, the average rating, you're actually also working on your velocity. So uh, Aviary shared a very interesting feedback with us recently uh, that um, what they started doing is they start a stage rollout and then they start getting a lot of feedback from users and they analyze this feedback, which allows them to, 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 to cut their release cycle to two to three weeks, which they weren't able to do before or they are not able to do on other platforms. So just kind of by really shifting your, your, your cycle, your development cycle, to, to, to make kind of uh, addressing reviews a core part of it, you can also in in increase uh, your velocity and ship faster. Um, in, in the past year, we've done a lot of improvements to, you know, because we realize that uh, ratings and reviews are really important, we've done uh, a, a number of improvements in the area. Make sure you check them out in the Google Play Developer Console, new um, user uh, overhaul user ratings uh, section, overhaul user review section, and a completely new review analysis section that I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a minute and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But it's definitely worth kind of uh, uh, checking out all the, all the improvements that are there. Um, another thing that I'll, I'll come back to uh, a little bit later is uh, the new, mobile, go, new, new Google Play Developer Console mobile app, which we've launched. Uh, but in this case, I just want to talk about it very briefly in terms of um, how, you, how it can help you manage customer feedback and how it can, it can help with customer interaction. Um, in the new mobile app, obviously, you can see the latest reviews, you can see the uh, user rating, you can see various breakdowns and all of that. Uh, but more importantly, you can also interact with your users. You can reply to user reviews directly from the, from the app. Why that's important here is because the uh, customer interaction has this very important time uh, component, so it's kind of it's important to, to, to reply to your user feedback in a timely fashion. And when you have, you know, kind of a developer console app in your pocket, this now becomes much easier. You don't have to go back to your desk and, you know, kind of uh, type it in properly there. Um, the other thing that we've launched with the app is uh, uh, no the notifications. So you can, um, you can uh, get notified when users uh, change uh, their review after your reply or when they post one-star reviews uh, or kind of um, anything like that that you would really like to react in a, in a, in a quick way. Uh, and talking about responding to user reviews, um, this is starting to be really big. Um, in the past year, we had 92% growth in the number of developer replies. This vastly, uh, uh, this is vastly bigger than the, the organic uh, growth in number of apps or organic uh, growth in number of uh, reviews that are being posted. So developers are really picking up this practice and they're really starting to, to reply a lot. Um, so this is worth, this is something that's worth considering. Um, if you, it does lead to more, to, to, to higher uh, average, uh, average rating. It does lead to, you know, kind of uh, users feeling more appreciated. So it's kind of users are all, almost starting to, 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 to expect now uh, the, the developers, that the developers will reply to their reviews. Okay, so uh, the other kind of, uh, talking about reviews, uh, we've uh, recently launched review analysis section. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, couple of different things that, where we really work hard to help you parse all this feedback and analyze all this feedback you get from uh, developers. Um, one of those is highlights. So we extract all the relevant snippets and phrases that users are mentioning in, in, in your app, and then we kind of, uh, uh, 
yeah, select them for you in both developer console. We also show these in the Play storefront. So it's kind of worth keeping an eye of when kind of what we're showing in the, in the storefront and, and checking it out in developer console as well. Uh, the other thing we've launched recently are review topics. So again, we do various machine learning and natural uh, language processing to extract the, the, the topics that we think are relevant and, again, that users are talking about when they, when they write reviews for, for, for your app. So for example, if you are uh, a language learning app like the one here, we would extract all the various languages that users are maybe asking for or, or uh, mentioning. If you are a, a car racing game, we might be talking about various different things about cars or about racing and, and so on. Um, on top of that, you can actually see how each one of those topics, um, what's the average rating of, uh, of re reviews that mention the topic, what's the number of reviews, and then also what is the effect on the rating that this topic has. So this kind of allow, uh, this basically tells you what is the easy area to focus on if you want to improve something. So kind of here, for example, we can immediately tell that the fact that this language learning app doesn't have support for Klingon, um, you know, kind of is causing like a lot of negative reviews. Um, the other thing that we've launched recently, also part of review analysis, was uh, benchmarks. So we identified eight characteristics that every app has. Those eight are things like design, speed, stability, and so on. Um, for each one of those eight, again, we show you based on your user reviews, uh, what, what is the average rating, how, like what is the sentiment of users uh, with regards to this particular uh, benchmark? And then we're, we also show you how your app compares on this particular aspect to other uh, similar apps, apps in the same category or apps uh, that are in the same monetization model or something like that. And then we also show you effect on rating. It's like, so is, is design a big plus of your app or is speed a big minus and, and, and so on. And then finally, kind of uh, one interesting point about review analysis, we also analyze the complete corpus of all the um, ratings and reviews on Google Play. There is a lot of them. Um, one interesting thing that we found out is that the majority or 50% of all one-star ratings mention or are related to stability and bugs. And then 65% of all five-star ratings uh, are related to speed, design, or usability. So it's kind of you know, important keeping in mind what is the thing that's actually driving the rating up and what is the thing that's actually driving the rating down. Kind of what are the things that users are really irritated with and what, what are the things that users are really happy about. A very brief mention for also our new reviews API. Um, if you want an uh, automated way to fetch your reviews from Google Play um, and to reply to them, we now have an API for that. Uh, it's only a couple of lines of code to integrate with it, super easy. Uh, however, if you would rather not do that, uh, there is also kind of out of the box uh, integration with the, some popular customer relationship uh, management tools like Zendex and Conversocial. So kind of if you, if you, you would like a more integrated approach to managing your, your customer feedback, uh, we have a way to do that as well. Okay, let's slot in these two tools as well. Uh, reviews analysis and review API, they're very useful, not in this first stage as you're launching your app for the first time, but they become absolutely critical at the point when your app is live and you're receiving all the feedback from users and you wanna keep working on it and keep uh, Im improving your app. Okay, the last thing, uh, monitoring your app on the go. Uh, as I mentioned, we launched the Play Console app at uh, I.O. this year. And then in the, you know, do, in, the, in the best kind of way of doing uh, what we're preaching here, we've also done a fast follower release a couple of weeks later. Um, this fast follower obviously included a number of stability fixes, uh, but it also included the number of new features that you guys told us uh, would be really good to, to, to have in the app. It included review notifications, being able to manage store listing experiments directly from the app, being able to increase the stage rollout or to halt a, a bad stage rollout of your app. Uh, if you still haven't tried the app, please do. Send us feedback, we're reading it, we're actually reading it, we're we are, uh, kind of uh, trying really hard to, to, to address it and we're, we, we wanna keep adding new features to, to, to Play Console app. And one more mention of another app that we have, which is Playbook for developers, for you guys. Uh, this is the perfect place to keep getting insights about what's new in Google Play, to, to find out about new features, to get best practices, to get tips and tricks, and general kind of a lot of advice on what is the best way to succeed on uh, Google Play. Um, slotting these two in, the, uh, we think both Play Console app and Playbook app would be useful all throughout your kind of uh, launch lifecycle. So just kind of, you know, make, make sure you, you try them out. 
And I think that's everything I wanted to cover today. Thank you. Cheers.